It was about 5.45 in the morning, and my director of operations, my number two guy in the squadron, called and said, hey, sir, I'm sure you're tracking that there's a soccer team stuck in a cave in Thailand. It's a long way in. Most of them don't even know how to swim, let alone dive, and we're all wondering how this is going to possibly work. And to be honest, the prospects are bleak. So we go into the cave and it was completely dark, but I could just sense like, oh my gosh, there's like 12 children and a coach in here. And I'm just in the entrance way and I'm spooked out. I can't even imagine. Talking to a lot of the experts that do cave diving as a hobby, you were like, man, this is one of the five most dangerous caves I've ever been in, in my career. And, and that was kind of, you know, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. The first thought is they're not going to get out. I mean, the kids, we've done recoveries before with live people, and it's all about panic underwater. I was always confident we could get them out. It was getting them out alive. Welcome to Four Corners. For more than two weeks, it seems the whole world has been transfixed by the extraordinary mission to save 12 boys and their soccer coach trapped in a flooded cave system in Thailand. What began as a local emergency grew into a full-blown international effort to rescue the 13, a battle against rising water and against time itself, with the impending wet season threatening to overwhelm the rescue effort. A global team of cave diving and logistical experts led by the Thais mounted one of the most remarkable rescue missions ever undertaken. Tonight, members of the heroic rescue team tell the story of what happened inside the cave over 18 long days. Members of the American, British and Australian teams have spoken to Four Corners about the complex and life-threatening operation and their elation at the result. Reporter Mark Willisey has our story. Saturday afternoon, June 23rd. 12 boys and their soccer coach head into the rugged mountains of northern Thailand for a trek. They pose for photos before riding to the Tum Luang Cave, a place they have visited before. They are expected to return home to their nearby village later that day. A dozen members of a youth football team and their coach are missing after they entered a cave in northern Thailand. A massive rescue effort has been launched. Investigators believe the teenage boys and their coach crawled into the cave and they never came out. Search and rescue crews are on the scene trying to locate the boys. It's believed the team has been trapped by a flooded stream near the cave entrance. Within 24 hours of the boys going missing, a search operation is underway. The boys' bikes and backpacks are found near the entrance to the cave, which becomes ground zero in the search. Distraught family members gather. The Tum Luang Cave is a 10 kilometre long limestone cave system with deep recesses and narrow passageways. Most of the year it's relatively dry, but when the monsoon comes, it quickly fills with water. And when that happens, the cave is impossible to enter or to leave. The water levels are now rising and the boys cannot swim. Oh, 
The night after the boys are reported missing, the Thai Navy's Elite SEALs diving team join the search. Working around the clock in pitch darkness, they wade, swim and dive through the black waters. At the same time, agencies and volunteers begin the mammoth task of pumping water from the cave and surrounding area. If they're in the right place, they could survive for five, six days. But the water now, the, the, uh, the, the flood water is, is, is getting higher and higher. So it'll only be a point in time where the, 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 this cave here, even the entrance, will close. By day three, the search has escalated into a major military operation. Go, go. <clears throat> Hundreds of searchers scour the mountain for alternative entry points into the cave. The hope is the boys and their coach have made it to a location clear of the rising water. คือพื้นที่เป้าหมายถ้าน้องๆว่าเป็นที่เขาเรียกว่าเป็นเป็นโถงสาเป็นทรัพยาบีเนี่ยอ่าครับขอให้น้องๆทุกคนโดดไปครับเพราะว่ายังยังเชื่อว่าทุกคนยังรอดชีวิตอยู่ครับ After 4 days there's still no sign that the boys are alive The Thai Navy SEALs are unable to navigate the labyrinth of tight passages filled with murky flood water. Thai authorities call for international help. Is that a green freezer? Yeah. Yeah, so it was uh, Wednesday morning. I was still at the house. It was about 5.45 in the morning, and my director of operations, uh, my number two guy in the squadron, called and said, hey, sir, I'm sure you're tracking that the, there's a soccer team stuck in a cave in Thailand. Uh, be ready, because we were being notified that we might uh, head out. And, uh, and I thought, Awesome, that's exactly the type of missions that uh, we want to be called up for. The next thing I knew, you know, we're all loading onto an MC-130. Uh, it's one of our aircraft and we're, we're flying to Thailand. Landed at about one o'clock in the morning on the 28th of June and then uh, key leadership pushed straight to the cave site. Did you guys go into water? No, we tried to go into the cave, they pulled us back at about 50 minutes. So we go into the cave and it was completely dark. And like I'm walking in thinking like this is so surreal. I mean, it, it's so dark. A few of us had headlamps, I did not, so I'm trying to tag along as closely as I can to some of the other members of the team. But I could just sense like, oh my gosh, there's like 12 children and a coach in here. And I'm just in the entrance way and I'm spooked out. I can't even imagine. Two British cave divers have also been called in by the Thais. Rick Stanton and John Valanthan are considered the best in the world and are the first to dive deep into the cave. They brief the Americans on the daunting task ahead. The technical experts from the United Kingdom, they had begun diving much sooner than us and uh, 
getting their feedback was also invaluable. You know, th those were when the rain levels were the highest, and they were saying, hey, you know, in cave diving, you, you have to be able to lay line, you have to be able to have a way out if you're going in. And they were saying the currents right now are not manageable. You know, we've been battling to try to move forward. The rains are still falling, the flows are getting higher, the visibility is zero, the water's cold. Like, let's, let's take a minute, everybody take a deep breath, and let's come at this from a collective perspective of how, of how can we tackle a really complex problem that I think over the next few days and even weeks we realize, like, has never been done before. On Sunday, July 1st, a break in the rain allows the rescue dive team to set up a base inside one of the cave chambers. The British divers forge deeper into the cave. Far below the surface, they swim against strong currents for 1.5 kilometres. And then the moment that seems like a miracle. Almost 10 days since they first entered the cave. Yeah, how, how many of you? 13? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Backpack is being going inside. No, not today. Not today. There's two of us. You have to die. We are coming. It's okay. It's okay. Many people are coming. Many, many people. We are the first. Many people come. What, what day? What Tomorrow. Day? No, no, no. What day is it? No, okay. <laughs> Monday. Monday. Okay, but one week and Monday. You have been here ten days. Ten days. You are very strong. Yeah. Very strong. Uh, uh, please go up. Okay, go back. We come. We come. I know. I know. I understand. We we come. Okay, we come. We, we come here. We have been diving for one half. Yeah, tomorrow, but we hope tomorrow. Navy. 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 You go up. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Up. 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 We we are happy too. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So where you come from? England, UK. Oh. Initially, it's a huge sigh of relief. Okay, the, the boys were able to find a high enough ground. They've survived this long, you know, with some of the higher flood levels in the cave. But then it was, it was scary because we realized how far back they were in. There have been diving rescues that are done consistently and cave rescues that are done consistently, but cave diving rescues are very rare and none of them have ever been done with 13 people, 2.4 kilometers, into the earth. The families feel like their prayers have been answered, but it turns out their ordeal has only just begun. The boys and their coach have been without food for a week. They're tired and afraid. The only way out of the cave is by diving, and as far as we know, the boys can't even swim. After locating the boys, the British divers Stanton and Valanthan call in reinforcements from home. I'm a member of the British Cave Research Council diving, re diving team, so um, that's how I got called in. And when you hear that it's 12 children and a young coach, they're in this situation, what's your first thought about the options or the viability of getting them out? The first thought is they're not going to get out. I mean, the kids, we've done recoveries before with live people, and it's all about panic underwater. Um, 
you can't you can tell a kid whatever you want but in an actual situation where you've got a kid on the water they're more than likely going to panic so at first we thought it's not possible to actually dive them out Jason Melanson's first dive into the cave confirms his fears you're swimming against the current on the way in so usually on the way in the visibility is not too bad and usually fine the first diver but the first dive is finning, and that finning creates eddies in the water, which stirs up the silt, and then the second diver doesn't get such a bad, uh, sorry, such good visibility. And then the third diver gets even worse, so that by the time you've got a fifth or a sixth diver in there, they're down to nil visibility. And then when you get to the end of the cave and you, you turn around and come out, you're with the current, so anything that you stir up at the end of the cave is gonna flow all the way out with you, so you tend to have a much worse visibility on the way out. So it's a, a bit of a sort of a combat course on the way out in sort of, sometimes it's, you can only just feel the line. Sometimes you can see a, f a foot in front of you. Other times it's just nothing, it's all by braille and you, you're trying to remember all these line traps. So it's, it's quite a sort of mentally exhausting experience to go there and back. The unfolding drama is now a major international story. Hundreds of journalists are here in a makeshift muddy village at the foot of the Nung Non Mountain. Thai people have also flocked to the site from all over the country to do whatever they can to help. A 24-hour tent city in the middle of this remote location is feeding and supporting thousands of people involved in the operation. Almost everything is being freely supplied. Everyone coming here, working long hours, hauling dirt, trying to, you know, feed everyone and volunteer their time and probably their money and their expertise. It's a sign that when the chips are down, I suppose people of many nations can come and work together. It's beautiful to see that. I can't even speak to the Thai leadership that we, that we saw here in this operation, as well as to the people. I mean, it, it's such a beautiful culture. All the volunteers out there, you know, giving their time and their resources and never losing hope. The operation has shifted from search to rescue. A party of Thai Navy SEALs, including a medic, reaches the stranded boys, bringing food, water, heat blankets and medical supplies. Surprisingly, they only have minor injuries. Waiting above ground, the boys' mothers are overjoyed as they watch the video of their sons. What's it like diving up there and seeing all these kids huddled there with their coach? Um, the first time, it was quite interesting. They all seemed, you know, in good spirits. Um, where they were was a, quite a desolate place. Um, they've nowhere to go but that chamber. They've, they've got to go to the toilet there, they've got to eat there, so the smell's quite bad. Um, it's quite warm. Um, the first day, me and myself and Chris went through to orientate ourselves with the care. We went and visited them and chatted with them. Like I say, they had the, the four Navy SEALs in there, so they had somebody to sort of look after them. We took them gifts in from the, well, letters and gifts in from the parents, and we brought messages back. So it was, it was quite a good experience for them and for us to sort of, you know, pass on messages from the outside world. <laughs> While the nation and the world celebrate the boys' survival, 
rescuers grapple with the enormous challenge of how to get them out. The search for alternative entry points to the cave has proved futile. And we were trying to find any other way because uh, we knew the dive one was going to be the most dangerous to find a way to get these kids out. We've had hundreds, if not thousands, of the Thai military that we're linked in with, and they're, they're not finding any other access points along the side. And we found all the caving experts that we could, and they all confirmed, no, that there's one way in and out of this cave, and that's at the front entrance of it. There is no other option. The mission could not be more dangerous. The boys and their coach are a kilometre below the surface and 2.4 kilometres inside the notoriously treacherous cave. The hardest thing is just trying to portray in words, you know, without physically being in the environment, like what some of these guys were up against. And talking to a lot of the experts like that do cave diving as a hobby, we're like, man, this is one of the five most dangerous caves I've ever been in, in my career. And, and that was kind of, you know, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. And then on top of that, we need, to, we need to get a bunch of people out. And on top of that, the water's cold. And on top of that, it's muddy. You, you have zero visibility, so it's, everything is feel, uh, you know. So you might have to uh, reach around and feel through different stalactites or rocks. Uh, and then there's parts of the cave where the water really speeds up, you know. It goes from narrow to thin. Uh, and trying to fit through there and to deal with some of those flows becomes very dangerous. The option of leaving the boys where they are until after the monsoon season has been canvassed but abandoned. Some of the divers had an atmospheric monitor that was showing oxygen levels uh, getting less and less, which is a huge concern for us because one of the options was, hey, let's leave them in there for four months. So then that was not looking like the best option. And then the food alone, you know, we, we were able to get to, with, with a group of, you know, Thai and, and, and British divers, some food back, but it was about 100 meals. But for 15 people, you know, 13 to 15 people, that, that wouldn't last very long. And then just looking at like the cleanliness, the hygiene, if they were to have any sort of an infection, like, so a lot of those initial, let's maybe try to wait out this water, for three, four, five months became kind of unrealistic courses of action. Military engineers work through the night to install a kilometres long cable to deliver oxygen into where the boys are stranded. But the idea is quickly abandoned as it's impractical. Pumps are in action draining water out of the cave, but heavy rains are forecast, which could quickly submerge the entire system. This is just one of a number of pumps brought in to try and get the water level inside the cave down. Some have come from as far as the United States, and without them, the rescue mission would be infinitely more dangerous. The rain was still so much of a factor that every single pump was getting overwhelmed and it, we were fighting mother nature trying to uh, get this much water out but it was really the understanding that the flow of water coming in and the lowering of the oxygen levels in chamber nine that that's that's what kind of forced us to a decision of hey we've got to do something now a contingent of Australian police and army personnel has been on the ground since early in the search. But it's two veteran cave divers from Australia who will play a critical role. They were about to go on holidays. I'm all packed up, ready to go for a trip to the Nullarbor. Uh, Harry and I were um, on the way the next day, and so I had 45 minutes to head to the airport. So in that time, I had to unpack everything that I had reconfigure and get the gear that I needed for this trip and go. Dr Craig Challen is a recently retired Perth vet. His friend Harry is Dr Richard Harris, an anaesthetist from Adelaide. They have dived together all over the world. So we'd already been in contact with the British over the day leading up to this and so we're broadly familiar with what was going on in the cave um, and yet yeah, to be honest not not looking good at all it's a long way in you've got 
uh, most of them don't even know how to swim, let alone dive, and we're all wondering how this is going to possibly work. And to be honest, the prospects are bleak. On Friday, July 6, as Harris and Challen arrive at the rescue site, there is a tragedy. News breaks that a former Thai Navy SEAL involved in the operation has died. Petty officer Saman Gunan had left the Navy but signed up to join the search as a volunteer. Saman had been delivering air canisters along the route being used by the divers in the cave. In a cruel twist, he lost consciousness after running out of air himself on the return dive. การเป็นรายงานมีความผิดพลาดเมื่อวานนี้พวกเราถ้าใครเห็นนะฮะพวกเรานั่งซึมกันทั้งทั้งค่ายนะฮะทุกคนเราไม่เคยรู้จักเข
the Thais were able to secure a pool at a school, and we went there and we actually dry rehearsed where we had divers and children wearing the equipment they were gonna use for the rescue, practice swimming underwater, practice handing them off, uh, going through all these details and trying to basically game out to the best of our ability what we could do to ensure that when it was actually the decision was made and they said, yeah, we want to enact this plan that we could say, yeah, you know, to the best of our ability, we have rehearsed everything collectively as a community and uh, we're going to give ourselves the best shot even though we know this is high risk. Did you have any role in preparing them for the journey out? Yeah, we, we'd get out of the water in the chamber, um, talk to them about what was involved, we would get out and kit them up with the correct kit because we had to bring the kit in from outside each day. So we'd have to bring a wetsuit in, they'd get into the wetsuit, we'd put them in a buoyancy jacket, um, bring them down to the water, put them in the full face mask and check that the seal was good and make sure they were breathing okay. So we're fully involved in the whole operation. As preparations for the rescue move into their final stage, Everyone's morale is boosted when letters written by the boys to their families and brought out by British divers are released. Taking the messages back from the children out, that must have given you a good feeling because this is the first sort of contact they've had. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that was just impromptu. Um, nobody asked me to bring any messages out, but I had a wet notes pad, um, just a pad with waterproof paper, and I just thought, yeah, write a message to your parents, write it on this pad and I'll take it out. So, you know, you never, we, we never knew what was going to happen, we never knew that we were going to get them out, so I thought it was important, at least for them, to be able to send a message out to the parents. Maybe just to put them, the parents' minds at rest to say, you know, I'm not doing too badly under the circumstances. <laughs> Mom and Dad, I love you. If I can get out, please take me to eat crispy pork. I am fine. It is a bit cold, but don't worry. Please don't forget my birthday. I am happy the SEAL team is taking care of us very well. I miss you all. I really want to get out so much. And this from their devoted coach, Ekapol Juntawong. Dear all parents, we are fine. The rescue team is taking care of us very well. I promise that I will take best care of the boys. Thanks for all your support and I apologize to all parents. Please tell grandmother to make pork crackling with dipping sauce for me. I will go and eat when I get out. Love you all. Where they were at that time, at that moment, they were quite comfortable, but. It was only myself and Chris that knew what was coming in terms of the weather. And, you know, in a few days' time, it might not be so comfortable, but obviously we didn't say that to them. What did you think of the, the way those kids yeah. behaved and, and comported themselves? Really strong, really strong, you know, composure. We told them about the plan, the vague details of the plan that we'd have to... how we'd have to dive them out, and none of them were whimpering or crying or anything. They just accepted what we were going to do. Yeah, real mental strength from them, and which is really surprising considering, considering their ages. Saturday afternoon, and Harry and I are going in to look at the boys and the, the coach and see what sort of state they're in, and uh, very pleasantly surprised, really, about that. I mean, they're really keeping in good spirits. They've got the four Thai Navy SEALs in with them and those guys just did a fantastic job of looking after the boys and uh, keeping morale up so uh, everything was was looking really good in there they've um, they've had a few days of being fed after their nine days without any food and uh, very little water uh, so that aspect of it is good uh, but some of them are pretty small and fragile a couple of them are only 30 kilos so they're tiny little things, really. Um, they're starting to get cold after that time of exposure. It was fairly warm in the cave, about 23 degrees, but uh, I, over time, the, the dampness and uh, that temperature just eats away at you and, st and they're starting to chill down. And all they had was the T-shirts and shorts that they went in with, so they didn't have much exposure protection. How was it decided who goes out first, who goes out in what batch, and, and when did the coach come out? 
So that was up to the uh, the boys and the coach and the, the Thai Navy. We, we told them what was going to happen and said, you choose your best men and uh, out they come. So it was nothing to to do with us. Um, all the strengths, all weaknesses. Harry did not choose them, um, as has been suggested. So uh, I think it was their bravest guys that came out first. So the, the risk level was incredibly high. And in my mind, the, the possibility, the probability of success was about as low as you can get. So you thought there's no chance of getting the 13 out? I didn't think that there was no chance. Um, but when I was flat out asked, what do you think the probability of success was? Uh, I told the governor I thought maybe a 60 or 70% chance. So I was fully expecting that we would uh, accept casualties, maybe three, four, possibly five would die. It's now Sunday the 8th of July. The 12 boys and their coach have been trapped for 15 days. The conditions are getting worse as the monsoon closes in. There's a growing sense that it's now or never. I'm calm. Thing peak sub la. Today we're going to do D Day. Na kap. Mue sib mong hi pan ma. Jao na ti. Dam nam. Pu chiao chan. Dam nam tham. Jam nuan sib sam kon. Na kap. Dai kao pai. Padi bai gan. Pu chui. Chi vi. Nong nong. Kao ok ma. Na kap. Er kao. Si u thai ing ha kon. Na kap. Padi bai. Doi mi gan assignment. Chat chen. What about you, given your experience in your own mind as a cave diver? Were you 100% confident they'd all make it out? Or, uh, how did you feel? No, the, the first operation, so it, went, it was a three-day operation, the first operation, like, I was always confident we could get them out. It was getting them out alive. <laughs> The Thai authorities order anyone not involved in the rescue operation to leave the area. The media is moved 500 metres away from the operations centre. We're packing up everything. As night falls, a fleet of ambulances arrive. There's 13 of them, one for each of the boys and their coach. The task of bringing the boys out will be the responsibility of a team of 13 foreign divers and five Thai Navy SEALs. It will take them three hours to make their way through the narrow, dark passages to reach the boys. The main issue is, are these guys going to be taught to dive and dive out, or are they going to come out as a package and we're going to do everything for them. And um, it's really the, the former option wasn't going to be possible because of the, the language barriers and the fact that they're so young and so small. Um, so they were going to have to have the whole thing done for them. So this is where the boys are here in Chamber 9. Um, yep. So there's a, there's a hill here. Craig Challen will play a key role along the route of the rescue. But it is the unique skills of his friend, the anaesthetist, Dr Harris, that will be critical to the success of the mission. And how are you keeping the boys calm? Yeah, so they did have some sedation to uh, keep them calm because the worst thing that could happen would be one of those guys panicking. And if you put me in a full face mask with no previous experience and dragged me out of a cave for it's about a three hour trip then I would be terrified and probably panicking as well uh, so um, yep they were calmed down a bit um, were they totally calm the, the or best they... yeah yep yeah so yep. They, were, they were basically given an anesthetic to knock them out and take, uh, they take it. yeah yeah they were um, there wasn't very much activity there an official source has told Four Corners that the Australian government negotiated immunity 
from Thai authorities for any Australian involved in the sedation of the kids, just in case something went wrong. The rescue operation is an incredible feat of planning and coordination. So we kind of divided the cave up to make it easier into nine areas, right? Nine sections, uh, the mouth of the cave, and then you came down into one. Uh, and then we had chambers, one through three, that were a little bit larger and more technical with ropes. Uh, the really, really complicated spots were taken by British divers that were, you know, just extremely 30 years plus of experience. Um, and we did that, you know, knowing that certain people have different strengths and expertises, and so that's kind of how we task organized the entire team. Uh, and there was upwards of 150 people, you know, from Chamber 9 to the entrance of the cave, all working as one big team uh, with many different responsibilities. My role was one of the what we call recovery divers, so I would take a kid from Chamber 9 and bring him the whole way out. So with the dive in, we'd submerge with the, the kid, and it depending on how the line laid, we'd either have them on the right-hand side or the left-hand side, either holding the back or holding the chest, either face here, depending if we were likely to hit the roof or not, or if we could see what was going on, we'd, we'd hold them out a little bit further. Swimming through uh, the sump, the first day, uh, reasonable visibility, I could see sort of a metre in front of me, so I didn't have to hold onto the line. By the last day, it was nil visibility, so it was much more... Uh, mentally exhausting and I had to have the lad really close to me because if you didn't, you were bashing his head against the rocks. Whereas if I had my head quite close to him and I extended my head above him, my head was bashing the rocks first so we could do... It, the visibility was that bad, you couldn't see the rock until you actually hit it. So each section of flooded section was a, a much slower process when the visibility was bad. I'm well, one of the divers, so where the boys are, there's a, a diving passage of about 350 metres, Then they come out of the water, have to have all the gear taken off them and get carried over um, some passage and then get back into the water again. That's about 200 metres or so over some rock piles, pulling them through a sump. And so I was at that stage de-kitting them after the first small dive transporting them across that, um, getting their full face masks and all their, their dive gear back on again and getting them sent off with the divers. So after the first flooded section, there was quite a long dry section. We had guys there with a stretcher. So as soon as he came out of the water, he'd be into a stretcher and what we call a drag stretcher. So you can drag it along the ground to the next sump. And so Harry would send them on the way We'd dive them through the first flooded section where the, the, the drag stretcher was. Craig had assessed them, make sure they were okay for the next part of the journey. Assess them through the dry section until they get to the next sump. Give us the okay that it was okay to continue. There were certain areas that involved floating them. There were certain areas that involved diving them, swimming them. If we have two rescuers per child, you know, and ensuring that just at all times, uh, if there weren't two, there was one always holding on to the child. So you physically got a, a grip on the child and you've got to then pass off to another diver. It's The visibility is that terrible and I suppose the pinch points are terrible as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said earlier, it's not, it's not one section of the cave. Like There was also sections where uh, we had harnesses for the children, improvised harnesses, and there was huge 150 sections of high line where we would have them, you know, uh, placed uh, on the high line and maneuvered across these very, very steep caverns where we knew trying to walk them all the way down back into, into these muddy areas and, and tight areas would be real dangerous. They had a, a full face mask on. So it was basically that one thing that if the, the mask that they were using became dislodged and water entered that mask and it wasn't, couldn't get it out, that was the one thing that would kill them. You got to a section, you know, the, the vertical section I was talking about. And by that time, you've been in the system for five hours. You don't remember where the vertical section is, and the only time you find about it is when you, your head bangs against the wall there and you, you're trying to get yourself through this vertical section, but you can't remember exactly how it's laid out. So I'm trying to get myself through it, but I'm also trying to get a kid through it who's vertic sort of horizontally in the water, trying to post him through. No, that doesn't work, pulling back, trying to post myself through. That doesn't work, and you could spend several minutes at one just one obstacle, 
to try and find your way through and, you know, eventually we did it, but it's a very slow process and quite, quite daunting. Did you feel in control the whole time? Or were there I was in moments? control in terms of, I, I knew I always could get myself out. I knew as long as I didn't, the main thing is you always got to keep in contact with, with that guideline. If you lose a guideline, you're in a lot of trouble. So I was confident of getting myself out. I was confident of not losing control of the line. I was confident of getting the kid out. I wasn't 100% confident of getting him out of life. Because if we bashed him against a rock too hard and it dislodged that max, uh, mask and flooded his mask, he, he was a goner. So that's why we had to be very slow and careful about not banging them against rocks. สิบหกวันแห่งการรอคอยนะครับวันนี้เราเห็นหน้าหมูป่าแล้วนะครับแต่ปฏิบัติการวันนี้ประสบความสำเร็จมากกว่าที่คาดนะครับน้องคนแร
brilliant, really. He was the linchpin of the whole operation. Without him, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. Um, his bedside manner when he was there with the kids and that, talking to them, calming them down and stuff like that. He was the one that sort of sent them on the way and we were just the transporters. So, yeah, he was the, the linchpin of the operation. Well, the news is filtering out unofficially at this stage that all 13 members of the Wild Boar soccer team are out of the cave, that this rescue mission has been an unrivalled success, that this is a miracle rescue. <laughs> The 18-day vigil is over. Five out the last night. Yeah. It's an amazing story. How did you feel when you finally got that last, that last member of the team? Quite emotional, you know. As we were getting closer and closer to the entrance, I got quite emotional. I don't normally, it's just the thought we were doing was to come out. And I've got a kid myself now, so it was quite a good feeling. You know, you had the last group of people come out, and then we knew all four Thai SEALs came out, and uh, everybody was all standing there around, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And we actually took a moment and let the emotions come back in, and I think that uh, it, it really hit, kind of hit you in the feels, and we were like, man, we, we just accomplished something. As a, a huge team, it took all these different people coming together, um, and I think that the, the world was watching one way or another, you know. enormous sense of relief and this is when it's good for the divers because we get to just walk out of the cave and uh, go home. Um, everybody else still had a lot of work to do. The, the um, Thai Navy guys still had to swim out so they were another two to three hours behind. The soccer team is safe but there's a final moment of drama for the rescuers still inside the cave. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was kind of a supernatural intervening, but uh, one of the pumps back at Chamber 3 failed, and we had a fair amount of guys out there uh, waiting for the last group of SEALs to come out, you know. Uh, and we got the call, hey, water levels are rising fast. Uh, that was definitely a, a spike of adrenaline towards the end of the night. For the Thai authorities who led this mission, it is a dream result. Team Thailand, Team Rajasthan, Pom Ekachon, Team Sir Mon Chon, who helped us, all of us are working hard for the whole world. We are doing something that no one could have thought we could do. It's the first time in the world. It's the most important thing, the mission of Thailand to do. Thank you very much for the people of Thailand. The 12 boys and their soccer coach are recovering in hospital, still seemingly unaware that the whole world has been watching. We went to the hospital to see them yesterday. It's a really good experience. Yeah, they're all sitting up and happy and eating. <laughs> the words cannot describe how happy we were. Yeah, um, it honestly was not a result that we thought we would get. We were. Uh, we, we thought there was a very real prospect that we would be doing body recoveries rather than um, live patient extractions from there. Um, and, you know, as I say, I'm still pinching myself a little bit, wondering if that's really what happened, and it does seem too good to be true. I remember when we were first here and some of our tough guys were saying, like, I don't even know if I could survive. Like, these are kids. And for me, it's like it just showcases these children's will to live, um, as well as to, you know, the coach that provided that guidance. And, and yeah, I mean, these are some brave individuals. And I, I, I really do know that they're going to go down in history for the courage they showed. It's one of the most difficult and dangerous and risky things I've ever done. Not in terms of my own personal safety, but in terms of the people I was responsible for. I've never done anything as risky as that, and I don't think I ever will again. But it was the only option we had, and we took it. 
in a world full of bad news, how good is this? This is awesome. I mean, we're so incredibly overjoyed that not only is it a good news story, but at the end of the day, we got the kids back together with their parents, and that's what matters in my mind. Hello, I'm Adun. Now I'm very fine. I'm very thank you so heavy. Thank you so much.